so what I want to talk about today is this idea of criteria of success in the future bound ecosystem. Um, even in just the early few months of the work that I've been doing with people, I hear a lot of feedback. One of my gifts is just synthesizing and making sense of a lot of different parts. And I was starting to sense there's something really special and different about ventures doing work in what we're defining as future bound. And being the educator in, in my background, I was like, we need to make this more explicit and help people see what we're really trying to shoot for. And so I want to share that today. Um, I'll try and have some time at the end for Q&A so you can push and ask questions. This is also still kind of a working draft. I don't know if I have it totally right. So if you have feedback and input, I'd love to hear that from you. So um, I just introduced myself. I'm Sarah Beth. <coughs> And this is what I want to go through in the next 20 or so minutes is an overview of Futurebound. Just make sure you're all on the page, kind of know what this ecosystem is. Give you a brief background on child development. I think it's important just to set the stage of what are we focused on in this work. Looking at typical drivers of venture or business development, what do we usually use when we're talking about ventures? And then what are Futurebound's four drivers that we're playing with? So Future Bound is trying to do three things right now. First, we're a catalyst. We are bringing people together, right? Someone has to help open up the silos, build bridges, be the glue, and help people connect that aren't connecting before. So that's an easy, obvious role that Future Bound's playing. The other part is articulating what is the big picture, the forest through the trees. There's a lot of different parts of the ecosystem, but who is really helping us see what, what is the gap? What is the opportunity? How can we work together in ways we're not seeing? And last is this idea of enhancing vibrancy. So success for me in Futurebound is helping everyone get what they need when they need it to the degree they need because ecosystems are living systems and it's all interdependent. So vibrancy is your health. It's how well you're functioning. Are you achieving your mission? What do you need to get there? And so if that's an existing organization, if that's a new venture, if that's a program, vibrancy is all kinds of things. But I think Future Balance is helping raise all those boats together. So then we can provide better outcomes and support more children and accelerate impact. The ecosystem is woven of a lot of different parts. So things that we've been thinking about, Future Bound is part innovation, right? We call it an innovation ecosystem. What are factors that go into innovation? What are the ingredients of that? Future Bound is slicing through that, right? We also have this notion of venture development. So the startup community is important. Um, we also talk about community building because we're bringing people together in new ways. Obviously, another part is early childhood. That whole that whole sector is the children <laughs> focus. So we're thinking about that community too. So bringing these different theories and frameworks together is sort of how Futurebound's operating, which is why it's so complex, because there's a lot of different elements and we're trying to balance and understand these users and stakeholders, their needs and their pain points. So a venture in Futurebound, we loosely define as anything that's a nonprofit or a for-profit. This is not just business development. And it could also be with an existing organization like Mile High United Way. They've been around a really long time. They're still creating new programs and initiatives and efforts. So when they do that project, that would kind of be a new solution that's emerging. Government and research labs, they are also developing and designing new things. So when we talk about ventures, it's a very broad term. Just wanted to lay that out there. So a little background on Colorado. There are 48 million children um, in, this, in the nation between ages 0 and 11. So Futurebound is looking at the first decade of life as well as prenatal. That's one of our bounds of the ecosystem. But we are focused specifically on Colorado. So in our state, we have 1.2 million children. Almost half a million of them are living in underserved or low-income families. So we know there's a lot of need. There's a lot that we have to serve. And this is a big problem that children need developmental readiness and all the supports to thrive and grow. So what does it look like in those first years of life? They are the most critical. That's why this is such an important um, ecosystem to develop because the first 1,000 days are when a baby's brain develops the most. And in those earliest years of life, we have the most potential to provide experiences and to shape them as human beings so that they grow into these really phenomenal adults, which means later on they don't need as many services, they don't have as many health problems, we're not paying for all these things later on through society. And you'll see more about that in another slide. 
This is really what's happening in the brain in those earliest years. 700 neural connections are formed per second. That's an insane amount. There's no other time of life you have that much brain development happening. And it looks like, well, I'm sorry, this matters because everything with brain development is also part of your immune system and your nervous system. Those are all getting up to speed. And if those don't develop fully, you're more likely to have heart disease, asthma, ADHD. There's some really scary statistics how seven of the 10 leading causes of death in adults are all linked back to early childhood development. So we really want to make sure all children are set up to thrive and grow in the earliest years. And focusing on this time of life has huge return for later in life. Um, I love this slide. Has anyone seen this one before? It's this notion of what's happening with brain development, the red curve, and these are ages down here. So you can see there's a huge <laughs> spike in years, year zero to five, right? And then it starts to taper off. Um, I learned this week, interestingly, because we had a speaker from Harvard say that the plasticity in the brain never tapers and, and ends. You are always learning and growing, even to your, your last day of life. But it definitely slows down a lot. That's why learning when you are an adult is harder and just changing who you are to, takes more time. But as a baby, it's just constant. It's happening all the time. But conversely, look at public spending. When children are young, we are not putting as many public dollars into the system. But then as people grow up, we have so much more funding coming into the system. And that just doesn't make sense. Why are we investing so much so later? And Heckman, as is called Heckman's Curve, he's an economist. He looked at that correlation of ROI, the return on investment. And he said, if we invest more money at the earliest years, we can have up to a 13% return on societal value. That's a super high return. If anybody knows investing, it's almost, it's just very, really difficult to get that in any way. So in terms of social impact, we all have the highest chance. So ventures in this space, we want them to succeed, but we need them to have certain ingredients to do that because when they do it and do it well, we're saving money in the long run, we're having more impact on children and more impact on society, and that's gonna help everybody thrive. Okay, so what are these drivers of a successful venture? When you think about this, I just want to throw out to the audience, what do you look for in your own work? What are some of the things that you use for success right now? So you, you, you wanna know what works, basically. Like, we created this idea, we want it to do good. Do we know if it does what we want it to do? So that would be a driver of success. Awesome. Evidence. <laughs> Impact. What else? If you're building a business, so this is kind of putting our like MBA hats on for a minute. What are those structures that help a business succeed? Revenue. Revenue. They need to have money. Are they profitable? Can they sustain themselves? Awesome. Are the customers happy? Do they like what you made? Are they using it? Yeah, you have to figure that out. Equity. Equity. Is there access? Can people receive and, and find it? Absolutely. Anything else? This is good. We're getting the brainstorm going early in the morning. Um, it's been fascinating just over the last few years, I've been working with more startup companies and you sit down and you go, well, what's the problem you're solving, right? How do you know it's working? Why do people like it? Do you have customers? How are you paying for that? How are you funding yourself? So all of these are just the basic early questions any investor or mentor or business development strategist would be asking you to help you figure out how are you doing what you're doing and how do you know if it works? The basic <laughs> framework that I've seen in a lot of business um, materials is, is this Venn diagram. Desirability, viability, and feasibility. Does that ring a bell? So those three factors mean viability is the business. Like, do we have the money to do this? Can we actually create it and grow it, right? Do we have the talent, the resources? Feasibility is like, if you want to build a time machine, that's cool, but we actually don't have the technology and knowledge to do that right now. So it's not feasible, but it's a cool idea. And then desirability is the human factor. Do people want it? If you create a time machine, let's say you figured out, does anybody want to use a time machine right now? Are you too far ahead of the curve? Or does that not make sense for society? So you can have one or two, but you really need all three to be a successful and thriving venture. And they say innovation is when you hit all three. 
So that's just a business model I've seen a bunch. And it makes sense, right? It's just very logical. It's rational. It's like, yeah, these are the practical things a business needs to do. Let's talk about ventures in Futurebound. We already talked about how they have to have this child-focused component. We talked about all the social impact. So it's a little bit different in this field. Let's talk about the stakeholders that are involved, first of all. So you have the innovators, the people that are coming up with the solutions. Well, they go, how do I build a solution in this space? Who can provide the best advice on what I need to help me get where I'm trying to go? So venture developers often don't know the deep experts that are doing research on children or learning or design. They're, they're hearing problems in education. They're like, I should go build an app for that. I know how to do that. But they don't know how to always find the talent to help inform and give them the best knowledge. Providers and families. So this, this new venture, let's say, comes up to an educator and is like, I've got this cool new app. It's going to help kids read on grade level. And the schools are like, that's cool. We totally want our kids to read. But you can't test it on our kids. Like, we have all these standardized tests and scores and achievement metrics, and we can't be your, your test space. So how do we allow and find those spaces where these ideas can be tested? The funders, they you know, are focused on making money. They're going, well, who's your customer? Are you selling to schools? Do you know how long it takes to get into a school sales cycle? This is years. This is too much runway. I am not going to see return on my investment, and I'm not ready to invest in you. Oh, and you're going into healthcare? That industry is so regulated. This is so hard. Do you know what you're up against? So funders have some, they're, they're risk adverse in investing in ideas that are trying to hit this because it's not easy to get money to come back. And customers could be Medicare, they could be government. They're different models that aren't as easy as just going direct to customer. Child development leaders, they're awesome. They're like, yeah, we want innovation. Come on in, let's work together. But you have to know how to navigate our processes and systems. We have all this paperwork and we have policies and there's just a lot of people you need to work with. And they're like, navigating that is really challenging. And then the children are just like, I don't know, is it cool? Like, am I going to have fun? Is it a game? Is this, is this great? How do you solve for all of these different stakeholders? That is what we're up against in an ecosystem like this. Because most ventures can pick like one or two and just solve for that, and they're, then they're on their way, but not in future bound. So how does an entrepreneur solve for all of this? These are the four circles we're about to talk about. They also have to echo the first three we talked about. So it's not that viability and feasibility and desirability go away. That's also supporting these four criteria. So we're going to talk about that. So let's look at number one, credibility. That was kind of the first one we got out of the gate. Does this idea work and how do you know? So when you're in future bound and we're trying to focus on children, child development is the goal. How do we get that evidence? So you have to be able to show you have research, You've done some kind of beta testing. A lot of people are getting asked questions about random control trials, um, randomized control trials to show efficacy and evidence. That is really hard. So the benchmark is hard, high. People are skeptical. So credibility is a huge factor, and there's a lot to it. The next one, we hit this too, that idea of equity and accessibility. Is your idea affordable? Can we get it into the hands of these underserved children? Families might not have money to pay for it, so who is paying for it to get your service there or your product there? Is it relevant? Are you being sensitive to different cultural norms and needs? Um, is, it, is it intuitive? Like, is your UI UX, does it flow? Is it simple? There are so many levels of accessibility. I think we could go on and on. So this is a whole other part of the equation. Then the other side is practitioners or adults. How well do they like your product? So is this really helping the teachers or the clinicians do their job better? Are they able to use it? And do they like it? Sometimes this is families too. And then the last one, come on, there we go, is the children. So not all solutions hit two sides of users. Sometimes it does just end with practitioner. But if the solution is designed for children, then children have to love it and want to use it too. So meeting all four of those, plus being feasible and viable, is a very complex challenge. And I think stating this explicitly to ventures is helpful, because then this becomes an equation of how do we mentor them? When we sit down and have a conversation, are we helping them break this down and think about the different sides of their business? Um, 
one founder in particular really influenced my thinking in this. And he's been working on his idea for five years. I actually met him in almost year one of his work. And here he is five years later, he's still working on it. He's raised money, he's continued to push, but he kind of mapped this graph of how he's figured out different parts of his idea over time. And he's like, Sarah Beth, it took me the first year just to figure out like the UI, the UX, like that interface. And then the next year I had to test like, do people want this? Then the next year I had to figure out how to raise money. Then the next year I had to figure out how to make it accessible. Like every year it was like one more problem of these circles he was solving. I just want to emphasize how much time this takes because it's legitimate. And if investors can understand this ROI is slower, but it's more worthwhile, that's what impact investing is about. And helping ventures not be scared. If they want to go into education and healthcare and childcare and help us with these deep intractable problems, it's possible, but giving them a sense that this timeline is not overnight. This isn't an app you're going to get into the store in six months. This is going to take deeper work, more persistence, and more mentorship from different people to help figure this out. And we have to find the spaces that allow more testing and allow that evidence and accessibility to come through faster. So there's a lot happening here. So here's the question. What about companies we know already that are, that are big, that have been around for a long time? How well do they, they fit this criteria? Let's play with that. So we'll start with Nickelodeon. And this is just me kind of playing around. So if you want to debate this later, go for it. Nickelodeon children love, right? Some, sometimes it's accessible. They have video games and TV shows and stuff, but it's not really hitting all four, but that company does very well. It's well known. Lego, they definitely have used research. They've shown some evidence with being <laughs> brain-based, but are those Lego blocks really affordable? I mean, that, that's a lot to buy those kits. And are they really reaching enough diversity? What about Disney? Come on, Disney. Disney might be crossing a few, like parents love Disney. So they're kind of in that practitioner user bucket and children definitely love Dis Disney. <coughs> sometimes it's accessible, sometimes it's not. I don't know if Disney's really credible, so I didn't put it up there. So what the heck does it take to get to this middle? Because the middle's the bullseye. That's what we want for future bound. That's the question mark. So I call the middle of the bullseye a future on the unicorns, right? We've heard that term. Unicorns in business are the ones that are achieving these you know, billion dollar exits and IPOs and just huge companies. But what is a huge company for a future bound model? And it doesn't have to be a company. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a great research solution. So let's think about this. These are my suggestions of a unicorn. What about Sesame Street? Big Bird. Sesame Street's been around a really long time. They have a lot of research embedded in them. They're very accessible. Kids from all families and all walks of life are able to access their content for free or no cost, low cost. Um, parents love Sesame Street, right? Kids love Sesame Street. They are nailing it. How many Sesame Streets do we know out there? Like when I tried to brainstorm this, I was like, I don't know, <laughs> what's another Sesame Street? It's kind of a one of a kind. <clears throat> I do think I know one other. I'd say tools of the mind. Now it doesn't have as much, um, it's not as well known, but it is Colorado based, which is great. We have this in our backyard, but this has taken 10 years to kind of reach that state. It's just kind of at its bubble right now. It's taken 10 years because it took that long to get enough of the RCTs, the, the evidence base behind it to show this works for children. It helps do executive functioning and self-regulation and teach little kids just, just how to build their cognitive skills. It's a curriculum, and now they have an app that connects with it. This isn't something on the market for consumers. It's really meant for teachers who are trained in it because there's some special techniques um, to make sure it's effective. But they really are getting into the hands of children and making it accessible and relevant, and it's very deeply based in um, research. The educators are loving it, and the children are loving it. So it's really hitting all of those elements. So with that, that's, that, those are the four drivers. Um, I wanted to give you a copy of the handout, and I'd love to hear your thinking or take any questions.